Welcome to this week's Monday meeting. Today is April 12th, 2021. Monday meetings are a chance for motion designers all over the world to connect and ask questions, share inspiration, hear presentations, and then interact with industry leading artists on an equal playing field. Your host today is Mark Cernosia, and today's gonna be kind of an open discussion just to see if the community has anything they wanna talk about. Uh, if you have a question, use the raise your hand function, uh, raise your hand function under the participants tab, or you can also write question in the chat, um, and we'll field that as it's as it's going. Um, that's essentially raising your hands. And as usual, this call is recorded and posted places. So if you have any concerns about something you said on the call, let us know, and we can edit it out. Um, so. Other than that, I do want to just uh, open it up to anyone who might be um, dealing with something or have a question or, you know, want to just bounce some ideas or whatnot um, across the group. So uh, if you do, feel free to either put something in the chat or just unmute yourself and pop in. I mean, I had something come up recently, I guess I could ask a question on. Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm, I'm relatively new to motion design. I've only been doing it for about a year and um, been doing a lot of school of motion courses. And I got this email that was like the perfect client, like they had full storyboards to the point where it was like, you know, you could hit the arrow key and pretty much see the animation. Um, it was just like really buttoned up. Like you could tell that they've worked with the animators before and I, it was simple. I could tell it was simple, but I could tell they were like a big client, but I just did like, okay, this will probably only take me two days to animate, but I feel like I probably underbid like a lot compared to what they're used to. And I'm, I'm not sure how to approach those situations. Like I'm pretty sure I can get, it's like, you don't want to underbid, but you don't want to overbid. Like, of course you just multiply your day rate, but how do you figure out how many days should this take? You know? like for the smaller stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think one thing you need to uh, consider is just the hours off the box, essentially outside of After Effects or whatever program you're going to be using, like making sure that you're accounting for the amount of time you're sitting in meetings or, you know, producing the spot, essentially. Um, maybe your animation director, you know, that like, if they were to go to like a bigger agency or whatnot, there would be all these layers. And that is one advantage to going with someone like you. But at the same time, if you're just charging for your actual time on the box, making the animation, your bid's definitely going to come in much lower than uh, it probably should be. Um, yeah, I have a feeling that's what I did. Yeah, I mean, Augustine, I don't know. You just raised your hand. I'm not sure if you want yeah, to hop in. I was, I was just going to say that you're you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna do mistakes. So that's normal. That's part of the process. You you underbid like now. Probably next time will be better. But one thing like Mark said is like count everything. When I say everything is like not only the animation, but it's like the time you spend designing, researching images, uh, texting on Slack uh replying to emails all that is part of the job and part of the time that you have to like you know like get paid for and i mean as you go per project you keep on counting everything all the time and what i've done on my side is with time i've built this kind of like database of experience of how much things have taken uh, depending on the client, depending on the kind of projects, the kind, if it was 3D, 2D, After Effects, this and that, combine, not shoot, I mean, everything. And, and then with that, you get, you, you start building like kind of a grid that allow you to pretty much be correct on your estimation of time. And then just put your margin on top, you know, just say like, okay, how much more do I feel okay proposing this? And if they say yes, that means that you could have asked more. If they say no, they might negotiate and then you can lower it. 
or they say, okay, fine. So it's just in the budget we had, then perfect. I mean, that it's it's there's no like bulletproof process. It's a trial trial and error. But I would say like as you go, like start building this kind of like knowledge database of how much things took. Do you have to do research? Is it a technique you use? You I mean you are used to or not, and so on. And all that with time will help you build and estimate better the time and the money you have to ask. I've heard people sometimes just add like a percentage to what they think it's going to take. And I feel like had I done that, I'd probably be more comfortable with the amount of work that went into it. Um, like, I don't know, I've heard people say 15%, like whatever you think it's going to take plus 20% or 30%. Do you guys usually add like a percentage for like the unaccounted stuff that you typically, typically are going to run into? Yeah, I think too, it, it depends on who's hiring you. Like if you're working direct to client or if you're working through an agency, um, you know, there's a few different ways to approach this, but I mean, you got to think about it as this too. Like if you're being hired as like maybe part of a team to execute this, right. Then you're charging your day rate and you know, the, you tell the studio, your client, whatever, how many days you worked. If they're coming to you with like needing an end project as a result, and you're calculating in your head, all right, there's two days of animation work, maybe there's a day of producing and meetings and all that. That's where you have to start thinking about yourself as a uh, small business owner. And you have to not only take into account for the time you're working, but essentially that time you're working and your rate should be what covers your expenses. And that's what covers your time. Now, if you're thinking about it as a business owner and you want to grow your business, well, you're going to need to add profit onto that. So not your day rate necessarily isn't profit because you could hire someone. If you're like the business owner, you could hire me or you could hire Elizabeth or whoever, you know, like, and say, you know, here's the day rate, yada, yada. If that's how much you charge, then you're essentially not making anything as a business, right? So you have to almost build in a percentage for your profit and that profit could be profit, but it also could be a little bit of that leeway room where if you need to spend a little bit more money on like music or whatever it is, you have a little bit of wiggle room there, right? So I would say that's one way to look at it. And I think another good way for starting to think about budgeting projects rather than just day rate stuff is to, you know, put some parameters around it, but think about what like an average project may take you and how much time and all that. And then just more or less set like a baseline. Like, I'm not going to take on a project that's less than $3,000 because I just know through experience now that, you know, uh, it, it's not going to be less than that, you know? Uh, so if you can start thinking in those terms as well, you'll be a lot um, better suited to either weed out like projects that aren't going to be that lucrative for you or like, you know, could end up being a headache, <laughs> who mm. knows? And it wouldn't be worth your time, um, but it also just allows you to start from a baseline and work your way up from there, you know. Um, and I, I would be really curious to hear anyone else's take on this as well. Hey, Mark, did you already discuss the how much do I charge from Get Right? Oh no, no, I totally forgot about that. Uh, I just put a link in the chat for that. Nice. So they up, they updated it about a month ago, I think. And it's yeah, this one's pretty, cool. it's pretty freaking accurate now too. Um, Cause Penny and myself and others were messing with it on the day or the daily call the other day. And I would say it was in within like five to $10 of my actual day rate right now. So it, it's really good. And then at the bottom, it gives you um, project costs. So speaking of those like contingency things, if you know a product's gonna take 15 days and then it will automatically add on, you know, 15 or 20% for contingencies and things like that. 
yeah have bookmark you, that one have you <laughs> i've seen that before have you ever like if the client hasn't worked with someone that's done animation you're going direct to client have you ever sent that to them so that they get an idea of what animation costs or you just use that for your own purposes I would just use it for your own purposes. Right, okay. Because that should help give you a baseline. Because here's the other thing. So that that is taking it into account like from an animator's perspective. If you're working direct to client, that producer role could bloat way up because you might have to handhold like them through the entire process and really spend a lot of time educating them. And all. so that's again, more time coming from your schedule right so like i think it gives you a really good baseline but i would use it for yourself and then you know um yeah i would just use it for yourself <laughs> i don't know what anyone else thinks about it but that's my take well you kind of have to use it for yourself because it's going based off of what you want your annual income to be and like what you need your income income to be so you have to fill the whole top section first before you can even go down to project costs um, but if you sent that to them, they might think, oh, well, this guy probably makes 45,000 a year. That's a lot for a motion designer. And then fill it all out. <laughs> right. it's like, why isn't this guy's day rate, you know, 250 a day? Right, right. Yeah, I would add also that linking to what uh, Liam just shared as a, the web page is when you, when you calculate like what you want to do a year. And that's something we did here at home with my wife. I, she did because she's better at numbers than me. She kind of like calculated like how much we spent a year in like, you know, the rent, food, like things for the kid, this and that. You don't have to be like overly, extremely precise, but that gives you like a real, like real estimate of how much you spend per month, for example. Because generally you go to groceries and stuff and you say, oh, I'm going to take this and this. And you have like an, like an idea, but that's, I mean, once you start doing the math, you realize how much you're spending on this or that. And that allowed us also to change like how we were spending the money on food, for example, and stuff. Like we started cooking more, doing more of this, ordering less. And we kind of rearranged stuff. And not only it, we saved money, but it also gave us like a real, like, yeah, real, real fucking numbers. How much do we need to do at bare minimum to live as we're living now? Mm -hmm. And if we want to improve, well, how much do we want to improve? How much more, more, more money for what? And then you, we, we, that, that helped us also plan having goals and then estimate much better. I mean, if I was asking enough or not, or how many years I've been asking the same rate? Should I should I like increase it or not? How do I define myself now? I'm still medium, senior, whatever. And like Mark said, it depends on the job you're doing. I mean, if you're just animating, then you're just animating. But if they start saying to you like, yeah, okay, you could art direct this. Well, that's more work and that's a different rate. Oh, by the way, we want you to like do the whole thing. So you are writing, directing, and all those, all those things have different costs and different rates. And you should take that into account because way often people say like, no, it's the same rate for everything, which it shouldn't, honestly. Uh, so yeah, count everything, <laughs> keep track. Hopefully that helps you a little bit, Ryan. Yeah, I did. To, thank you guys. Let us know if uh, how things pan out for you there. And yeah. Definitely, thank you. Anyone else have things going on that you want to chat about this week? I just wanted to let you guys know I'm remoting into my big box from a co-working space. And I am not using Google Chrome because it's not fast enough. So I had to upgrade, but um, just kind of getting, getting the um, my bearings on, you know, how to access 3D while officially not being in a 3D role, you know, mm -hmm. so kind of 
being able to still harness all those tools of Cinema 4D if I need them, even if the result is going to be 2D. So just kind of walking the line, you know, and dealing with the new footprint of leaving the house ever and promoting into the big box that is sitting there back at home. Mm -hmm. So it's just kind of a weird thing. What did you end up using for a service? Splash Talk. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's what I so, used too. Yeah. It seems like it was kind of like not, not for, it, it's like enterprise ready, but it's not, you know, the huge, um, what is the, I want to say Tamagotchi. That's not the thing. It's a, it's the service that sounds like the word Tamagotchi, right? Oh, uh, well, there's uh, Teradici. That's the one. Yeah, it's yeah. not that. <laughs> I'm a few steps below that. Yeah. But uh, I didn't no, want Splash to. Splash Top is good. It's yeah. very affordable compared to something like a team viewer. Right. Right. Um, and people have been using that in Parsec, I think. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot of different uh, softwares to help do that. But yeah. Right. right. Cool. But yeah, it's spring break. So. I mean, the house is madness right now. I mean, I don't, I wouldn't be able to get any work done. It would just be great chaos. So mm. I'm really glad to be gone. <laughs> so <laughs> see ya. <laughs> there, there's a software that uh, I've been using for a job. Um, very like I, I've started, I just started to use it, but it's been really helpful. It's called Brazilio. Um, it basically p makes your computer like a, I want to say a torrent and then you can share with like as many team members as you want and all their computers are like on on the cloud i guess what i'm saying is it's not like google drive because you're not uploading anything anywhere so it's like a shared folder and whenever you need something you'd literally open the folder up and then that computer itself sends you the files so it's like peer to peer mm, uh, nice. and it, it's been re really useful because then there's no actual limit apart from your computer's file space so yeah, it's it just like, go ahead, Elaine. Oh, I was gonna say it's kind of like Napster, if you ever used that before, where like yeah. you host it somewhere and then everyone can connect to you to download it. But the, the nice thing about it too is if you are working with a client, um, once they're synced up, it always stays synced too. So it's a lot faster. You're like you're bypassing all that extra bandwidth that you would have to deal with other places. So hmm. um, it's like as soon as you hit save it's there and it goes to all the machines. So in a sense, it's kind of like BitTorrent too because it's all divided, but then they work together to sync all the files. So yeah, it's really fast. I second that for Lucky. And it just shows up as like a folder? Yeah, it's literally you a folder. A folder. Sure. Yeah, you, you don't do any, you make a folder and you say, all right, I want this folder to be shared. Also, um, um, if your computers are local, it'll t detect that and uh, it won't go to the internet. It'll just go locally. So it's nice. Like I have my laptop at home. If I take it to my office, I can like connect it to the network and then it, it'll sync way faster, really quick. So sometimes if I'm working away from one, one of the computers, I don't want to use all that bandwidth. I just pause the syncing and then hook it up locally whenever I'm you know, home or whatever. And yeah, I love Resilia. It's super. So it's, it's essentially Dropbox, but rather than going from w computer one up to the cloud, back down to computer two, it's just going from computer one to two. Is that yeah, essentially? Uh, yeah, peer to peer. That's why, it, yeah, that's why I, that's why I said Napster. <laughs> yeah, it's like, nice. yeah, it's like, it's yeah, like I need utilizing to look into that. that. Yeah, utilizing peer to peer. Yeah, it totally works. Um, Billy uses you, guys, you have that at Box for or a lot of people do. I know um, Billy's talked about yeah, it's, it's Leo. Billy and, I, Billy and I mainly do it because we, we're the ones that use like most like multiple computers all the time. But mm. we haven't like um, we haven't done like a shared account or anything yet. We just have individual ones, but we might look into it more. You know. Cool. It's really good. Yeah. Um, well, if anyone has anything else, please jump in. If not, I do. I have something to kind of propose to the group, but I'd love to keep it open for anyone if you have certain things popping up. Um, seems like a lot of people use Resilio. Grant does. Yeah, the, the person, person that recommended me Resilio was from VFX and they, um, they, they transfer like tens of, ten, like, like terabytes of data 
constantly. So if it works in VFX houses, good enough for me. <laughs> it should be good enough. <laughs> nice. Um, well, yeah, I mean, one thing I was kind of thinking about, and I'm curious just to, again, open this up to everybody, but um, where do you kind of, you know, what's your process for like coming up with like ideas? You know, do, pe do people, do you go out for a walk? Do you cruise the internet? Do you sleep? <laughs> do you like, I, I'm just really curious to, you know, hear what people have for kind of a process and how they kind of flush that out. You know, if they have an idea that comes to them in a dream or whatever, like, do you have a notebook that you write all the stuff down? Do you, I don't know. I'm just curious to know um, what you guys do, what you all do. Does anyone want to jump in first? Shower. That's basically shower. right. <laughs> like, <laughs> a lot of times I'll just be taking a shower in the morning like, oh, that's a cool idea. And I'll try and write it down so I don't forget because I'm senile. I thought you mean like an idea shower, like a baby shower where everyone comes and brings their ideas for your consideration. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was just thinking about it recently because like I know a lot of times great ideas come up when you're in a conversation with people and now with so many people working remotely and not necessarily having that camaraderie of an office and whatnot or, you know, those, uh, what is the stupid word they use? Think tanks or whatever, you know what I mean? Like you just have all these creative people together. Um, yeah, I don't know. I feel like personally, I'm more creative in an environment like that or when we're trying to come up with ideas and just, you know, whatever it may be, I feel it's a little bit harder to start when I'm like here by myself. I mean, I always have a folder you know. to keep a folder, like if you have any assets related to a concept or to like you store like textures or. Yeah, no, I mean, photos. like Pinterest, right? right? But like I'll write stuff down in like a app, like a notebook type thing of just like right. either different ideas or I'm watching right. something. I'm like, oh, that color palette. Oh, like I always try to write stuff down. Um, <laughs> But it also just kind of gets lost in the ether, <laughs> too. You know, like I write it down to remember it later, but then I don't even remember to look at it. Right. Well, I mean, if you get it to the screenshot stage, it's almost related to our other topic. Like if if you're capturing screenshots and they're going up to Dropbox or wherever, eventually you'll have to go through them and go, oh, I remember why I captured that. Oh, I remember yeah, why yeah, I captured totally. that. Right, and so it has a record that is, it's really fast to capture it. Like if you have to write it in a notebook, day's over, man. <laughs> Ryan, were you gonna pop in there earlier? I thought I heard you unmute. Yeah, oh, sorry. I was just gonna say, like, I guess it depends on if you're talking like personal project, like what you wanna work on for fun, or if you're thinking about like, it's some, the problem I need to solve, but. Like if it's personal, usually just listening to music will spark a bunch of ideas. But like if I'm trying to solve some sort of problem, uh, probably like many people, I just try to find as many videos that are similar and then just browse for design. And usually there's one or two things that I draw a lot of inspiration from. It's kind of like that book, Steal Like an Artist. Like you find something that is just like, oh, that's, that's kind of what I want the core. Like I don't want to do it just like they did but there's like something that gives you that like feeling where you want to create and you want to sit down and you want to get to work. Like I just look for that, whether it's on Pinterest or dribble or YouTube or Vimeo. And then, you know, I kind of shape it from there. And I always, I, I'm a terrible illustrator, but I always jot stuff down in my notebook just to block general shapes. Um, once I have like the blocking done, then I'll figure out, you know, style and it just, I don't know, it's, it's hard. It's all, it seems like it's always different, right? How we're like where the idea actually comes from, you know, you could, like you said, you could just be, you know, it could be six o'clock and you're going on a run at, at like sunset and you couldn't think of anything all day. And then all of a sudden you're like, 
that's it. That's what I want to do, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I listen, um, speaking of like the Still Like an Artist and the other books, Austin Kleon, um, there's a, a podcast called Creative Pep Talk. I don't know if you've ever heard that. Um, and he recently had um, the author of that, Austin Kleon, on um, the podcast. And I haven't made it all the way through, but it's kind of interesting. They talk about how some of, both of them, how some of their best work have come from when they've been like furious at something. And it just kind of like kicks them in the butt to like start this thing and it just takes off. And they both were talking about like, sometimes like that's the kick in the butt I need to really like make this thing happen. But it had me thinking about certain things too of like, you know certain times where a project's fallen through or like you've got so much pressure on you you're like fuck you still you just like push through it and a lot of times do kind of your best work because you're just so just like focused and ready to like pu push through it I, I know it takes time to get to that but you know there's certain things that have happened in my career where like if I <laughs> if I didn't use that emotion for it, you know, for something, then like things would not have happened like they did. And I'll give you the one example. Like I applied for a job, went through like all these interviews, thought for sure I had it, got, I did not get it. I was super mad. <laughs> and I was like, you know what? Fuck it. I'm going to, I'm going to email the creative director of this other company. And so I did. And I was like, hey, I could do this. I, I could do that. Video, animation, yada, yada. Long story short, got a job there. And I don't think I would have done that if I wasn't so pissed about this other job. I, I was just like, whatever. I have nothing to lose. I'm just fucking going for it. And like, that's a super roundabout way and, and related topic to what uh, Austin Kleon was talking about. But I feel like sometimes those moments of inspiration come from like either when you're on like a super high or a super low, or it, it's just, I don't know if it's like a fight or flight mentality or, or whatnot, but uh, I just thought that was super interesting. And then reflecting back on things that have happened in my life where that's happened, you know? <laughs> well, apparently there's some other people in the chat that <laughs> would have different reactions as in throwing things and, and all that but uh and Vishal I don't know if were you do you want to hop in yeah 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 um yeah can you hear me actually I, my mic is not I'm not sure if my mic will work yeah we can hear you oh uh, okay uh yeah so uh I can actually relate to your uh associating an emotion to it so I, um, that's something I use uh, on a regular basis. I, uh, but the thing is, I, uh, I try to get that emotion into uh, music and I keep playing that music over and over again. So there's some sort of a story associated. I have a visual of it in my head whenever the music plays. So I uh, time everything accordingly. I play it accordingly. So it kind of gets me into that emotion and that's, uh, it sort of gives me a drive to just finish it off like that. Yeah, that's all. Yeah, no, that's great. I, I've done that myself. I know other people that do that will just literally put the same song on like repeat. Yeah, just jam through it. So all you, all I need to do is just put on that particular song and it just you know just snap and do it. Does anyone else have thoughts or examples or has it happened to you where you, I guess, use certain emotions to spawn the creativity or spawn ideas that you can either execute on or I don't, I don't know. It's just a super generic question, I guess. Just a random thought that pops in my mind at the moment when you think that you failed, let's say, ah, no matter what I do, it's, it's like complete. Uh, it's so bad and then you don't have any 
inner pressure anymore because he somehow gave up and then said, I don't, don't give a shit. And then, then in this moment, like uh, if everything is so bad, everything is so shit, suddenly um, cool things come up, cool ideas, because you are completely um, detached from yourself. Or you, you're not like, I need to come up with this great idea. No, at the moment, I, I don't give a shit. I don't care. Um, it's the best way to really uh, let things flow. So I often had this. And then I come up with, with ideas which are, um, how to say, which are more and more out of the box. So because I gave up everything which was in the box. <laughs> yeah, and I think, you know, we've talked a lot about, you know, getting outside and going for walks and stuff like that. And that seemed to help people. And I, it probably is a in part to just disconnecting your brain from thinking about it. But yeah, it's just, it's really interesting. And I wonder like, you know, music is a great example of it too. It's just like channeling the emotion that you're feeling into a song or whatnot, you know? And I, I think it might, maybe it's harder for us to do as animators to channel that energy into a piece. I, I know it can be done, but you think like a song you can't scribble it out or whatnot uh lay down some chords or, or whatever and and try to get the rough outline of it but for us i think it's a little bit harder because the process takes a little bit longer i don't know is that is that kind of a cop out i'm not quite sure go ahead jeff Yeah, I don't, I don't think that's a cop out at all. I think because of the, you know, it takes so long for most of us to put together whatever it is, no matter how simple, right? You've got to go through this process, this technical process that's um, sort of a barrier in a way. I mean, I find that all the time. I have all these great ideas. Well, maybe they're shit ideas, but but to me, they seem like good ideas. And then I start to work on them and they just run into all these technical problems. And then, you know, time passes. And after a while, either you just lose the interest in the thing that you're doing or, um, I mean, more often than not, like work comes up and then you get involved in something that's, you know, paying you. And then when you go back to look at it again, either you, you just have no interest in it again or you're still sort of stuck with those issues. So. Like I have a lot of envy for people who um, picked an art form that's a little bit faster. Like, <laughs> like you know, animation is not, uh, it's not a simple, trivial thing. Although there are people out there that somehow seem to churn stuff out, but I don't know. Maybe it's me. Maybe I'm just, you know, uh, technically inadequate. I don't know. But Yeah, no, I mean, I think it's a interesting question because like how do you take that moment of inspiration capture it in enough whatever detail that you need to flush that into like a full-fledged idea right like and maybe i i i'm not good at it and that's why i don't have a great process with it or something like i i'm just not sure but I, you know, you listen to, or you read books about it. You read, you hear podcasts about of, oh, you know, I was doing this and I had this idea and it, but I'm just really curious, especially on anything that's, you know, high profile or whatnot. Like how does that moment inspiration really like, how does that thread work its way all the way through to the final product, you know? And um, I don't know, it, similar to what you were saying, Jeff, like just, the process and the technical process of a lot of the stuff we do um, hinders that quick work, right? Where you can try yeah. to capture it. Like a photographer can snap the, the photo, a you know, cinematographer can hit record, hopefully capture it, right? But for us, it just, it takes longer. And how do you keep that? I guess the moment of inspiration, but also the drive of like, an intensity of that moment. How do you keep that going? Yeah, that actually leads me to another question, which is sort of peripheral, but, and this really only applies to those of you who have, um, you know, uh, significant others and children, but do, do your, for those of you that do have children, do your um, 
significant others also work because I, you know, for, for us, like I, my wife is the primary uh, earner and, you know, my primary role over the last 14 years has been, you know, looking after kids um, and they've gotten older, but of course with the, the, the pandemic, everything went to crap, right? Both this <laughs> last year. And, and I know this is a common issue for a lot of people, but I'm just sort of curious to know how those of you that have kids have sort of balanced things. Cause I find it really hard, you know, to, um, to, to, to carve out the time that's required to, to do projects appropriately uh, and particularly client work, you know, like, like this past year, I, I've just with the nature of things, I've not wanted to take on client work because I can't guarantee I'm going to get it done. Mm. And we have a, a really irritating dog. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, boy, if time management was not a factor before or like an important factor before, it's the most important factor now, I feel like for myself. Um, and it's incredibly difficult. I mean, I know there was definitely stretches happening throughout the pandemic where my wife was a teacher teaching all day. So I was taking care of our son. Um, and then my day would essentially start at like 6 p.m. And I'd work late and just, you know, trying to tag team stuff like that, but definitely not sustainable. You know, I mean, after a few months of that, I was uh, pretty burnt out, but um, yeah, I'd be curious to hear anyone else, anyone else's take on that too. And Scott, I also saw you made a, a comment in the, in the chat just before uh, Jeff's question there, but feel free to hop into if, feel like it oh we can't hear you your mic's not on can't hear you yet unless it's me oh, it's, it's that there one. you go i heard something so, pop on i got i got too many too many things going <laughs> uh yeah but no just about kind of capturing inspiration um what you were saying before it's very much uh it's it's tough being an animator like because you know it takes so long to get like any sort of idea fully fleshed out but i've been trying to dive more into other forms of art that let me let me capture those ideas quicker so um i play i've been learning to play music a lot um just to kind of pick that up because i can just jump on a guitar i can jump on a piano and just like write out a riff and kind of i kind of combine that with any sort of project I'm working on because then I can hopefully reignite those emotions that I was feeling when I first had the idea and it's easier I feel like it's easier instead of like trying to write out a whole script I can write like a little riff or something like that mm -hmm. um, and it's also just a good form of like staying creative so I'm staying moving at least creatively but not getting like locked into animation so it's kind of mm -hmm. so I'm still thinking and still moving but like I'm switching my brain a little bit uh the other one too that I've jumped into is um doing a lot more sketching like I, I fell out of sketching a lot um and like the probably like it was probably about four or five years ago I almost like I stopped sketching entirely because just like my workflow didn't really need it anymore but now for the sake of doing, um, getting ideas down and like fleshing them out quicker, um, I will just, instead of trying to make like really nice storyboards or trying to build style frames right away, I'll literally just go in a notebook and write out like, and I'll do st uh, storyboards as quick as I can. And it's literally like stick figures uh, a lot of the time, but it's like, it's that really quick immediate action that allows me to get that idea down in a meaningful way um and i feel like oh i can spend 20 minutes story about storyboarding this idea real quick and at that end of that 20 minutes i can feel like a better sense of is this a good idea is this something i really want to pursue mm -hmm. or, or am i just going to toss it and throw it to the side which if you try to jump straight into 3d which i know a lot of people do like to do and i like it for certain projects as well you could that same process could take you four or five hours to determine hey is this a good idea that i want to keep pursuing so right right yeah and i think all this again leads into what jeff was asking about just you know how to manage all of this too like i think if there's certain ways where you can get your ideas down at least that quick rough draft, you know, similar like what Scott was saying, stick figures and all that. 
then you have at least a rough draft to go back to and keep refining until you get to a point where um, you can get on the computer to flesh out that idea. Um, but it, to me, my gut feeling just says process, right? Like you just have to have like a pretty robust process of like knowing, all right, step one might take me this long, you know, with all my other responsibilities, but if I can get my ideas down quick, I'll have a base to at least, you know, jump off tomorrow, essentially, you know, but yeah, I mean, I think the time management thing, we've always talked about that on Monday meetings, but especially through the pandemic and with anyone else um, in close quarters with you, it just makes work much tougher. And especially if you have a, a dependent to take care of as well. But um, yeah, it seems like music's a big outlet for a lot of creatives in this industry as well. Like whether it's guitar, you know, piano, drums, um, or people, you know, with MIDI's doing stuff with Logic and Ableton, stuff like that. Um, I think it'll, there's obviously a lot of the timing and a lot of similarities that way and how to lay stuff out kind of in the timeline. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It's interesting to hear people's perspective on like deal, like coming up in recording ideas because I feel like everyone has their own kind of subtle way of doing it. I know people who sleep with a notebook next to their nightstand or on their nightstand. So they can wake up and just jot something down. Like, I don't do that, but maybe I should. <laughs> well, one thing to try is just where are you gonna be bored next? You know, like, is there a task that you have in front of you that you know is gonna be repetitive and boring, whether it's personal or professional or whatever it is and, and treat that as an opportunity because um, like John Cage said, you know, the second you're going to be, um, the second you get into the boring task, uh, the ideas will come to you, right? Because there's part of you that's going to rebel against the boring task. Um, the ideas, he said, fly into your head like birds, is what they said, what he said. So um, you just need to find this, something that's boring enough. And so if you're talking about like what mechanism to capture the idea, just like make sure it's friendly for whatever this boring task is, mm. you know, like find a good a place to lay, a, you know, if you have to build a wall and lay bricks or whatever, <laughs> like that's where, <laughs> that's where your capture mechanism should be adjusted to, right? Uh, I want to jump in and kind of add on to what you said with the notebook. Um, I, I had, I do the same thing. I have one sitting by my bed all the time, um, but I never wrote in it because I didn't get in the habit of it. So instead of waiting for inspiration to like, and to wake you up and do something, um, try and write something small every night before you go to bed, even if it's just a, a, a sentence. So that way you get, it, it turns it into, that's what turns it into a habit that you'll then you'll then you then when you do wake up you will be in the habit of oh i've got this notebook that's writing it down i never used mine for the first probably year or so just because i didn't i hadn't established any sort of habit for it so mm -hmm. totally yeah i mean I, I find that even on the, the stuff i have on my phone like the apps that i use is once i get into the habit and i use it for like a week like all right now i'm using it if i just randomly jot stuff down in it i rarely look back at it have you guys heard liz blazer talk about the yes and method i found that helped me a lot <laughs> it's just like <clears throat> i'll use it for sketching too where because oftentimes where my creative process stops is when i overthink something mm. i'll be like this one detail is not right i'll get hung up and i'll work on it forever and then i might even lose motivation and then i might question everything but with that kind of like yes and in like early early stages where you just like yes we'll, we're gonna go with this and then what you know and then you just you just keep going until there's an ending to that idea yeah you know and then yeah. maybe you do four or five ideas but it's just if you just approach it with you know what i don't care if it sucks i'm just gonna see it through uh what happens next you know i feel yes. like that kind of helps flesh out an idea one thing i've done oh go ahead jeff i saw you pop on oh i was just gonna say just you know to to sort of emphasize what ryan's saying um I, I've listened to a few um, 
you know, well-known artists recently talking about their process. And, and Neil Gaiman was one who's saying that he basically, you get, you sit down every day and you write. I mean, he's a writer, so that's what he does, but he sits down and writes. And he goes, some days it's really easy and the writing just flows and it comes to you. And other days you struggle, but you do it every day. And then when you get to the end of whatever it is you're working on, when you look back at the completed thing that you've done, you can't tell which days were the good days and which days were the bad days. Mm. Um, so it's basically, yeah, it gets back to habit and just doing it, you know, sort of hammering away at it, making it habit. Um, and, uh, you know, I guess the, the, that's, you know, the, the process that gets you to an end result. Yeah, no, I love that. Well, and, and the one thing I've found too, like I haven't done a whole lot of this, but the, um, I don't know if you are all familiar with like mind mapping, you know, essentially you start with like a, an idea and it branches out. And like, if I do that through a number of apps that you can use for it, I find myself just like iterating off words just really quick, like lava, rocks, fire, blah, like just my mind's just kind of spilling out. Whereas if I'm like writing in a journal and I'm like listing stuff out, it's not as fluid for me. For, I, no, I don't know. Like maybe that's one reason why these mind maps work and there's so many softwares for it and, and all that. But um, yeah, you kind of get in that no, no idea is a bad idea state. And like uh, Ryan was saying the yes and like, so lava, yes and rocks and yes and ocean, yes and like who knows, right? Like it just kind of keeps building off itself. And then you can look back at it and weed the stuff out and chop stuff out and formulate a better idea. But um, yeah, I'm, I need to do that more often. I personally, I feel like I can flush out ideas faster that way. But that's also, I think, like the whole yes and is also um, very um, significant for like jazz musicians and like improv, you know, like you have someone who does a little solo here and then this, the next guy kind of riffs off it and then the next guy and it, I don't know, it, it, I've definitely seen it in that music space for sure. Or I guess any improv, right? It probably happens. Yeah, it, it happens in improv comedy troops and stuff, right? Like, I think it's almost an exercise that they do. But in those cases, it sort of depends on having some other people to bounce things off, right? Yes, right, right. Which circles back to your whole sort of question in the beginning, which is yes. in the, the current state that we're in, how do you do that? <laughs> yep, yep. Well... Maybe mind maps are away. Maybe Zoom calls and stuff like that are away. But it's yeah, it's just interesting to see how everyone you know concepts and comes up with these ideas. But I don't know. I you know maybe just think about it more and have it just consciously think about it while you're working on projects and stuff. And you know it'd be interesting to kind of round back on something like this and and really you know hear a little bit more from people about, you know, how their process is, but anywho. All right. Well, we're almost at an hour here. I think we're, uh, we can wrap it up unless anyone good has topic. good topic. Oh, cool. Yeah. I mean, just an open discussion, you know, um, yeah. we had the guest on last week, Mark, which was really cool. So thanks again to him for, for coming on. Um, but yeah, it's always nice to have the open discussions too. So, um, but yeah, if anyone has any questions, comments, suggestions, whatnot, um, you can email us at info at mondaymeeting.org, or you could hit us up on any of the social platforms at Monday meeting. It will populate. There might be an underscore in there somewhere. Uh, but anyway, Thanks for listening. We really appreciate it. And thanks for joining us this week. Uh, we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye, guys.